very nice to see you at least on a screen. I'm very sad not to be with you in Nisi Ross and um, welcome to, to the online people. I'm talking to you from my home in northern Catalonia, Spain in the only volcanic region of Spain. So I share that with you over there in Nisiros with your wonderful mythical volcano uh, that is up, up the hill next to you. I wanted to talk to you about what seems to me a real problem for screenwriters, which is what I'm calling the screenwriter's paradox. And the essence of that is that in order to be an effective screenwriter, you need to have certain qualities that are usually about being an introverted person, a, a, a person who likes to be alone with their computer, with their pen, with their typewriter, and struggle with the words on your own. Now that's pretty similar to other artists like painters, poets, novelists. The difference is once you've done that as a screenwriter, you have to completely change your character and become something very different in order to go out into the big wide world and sell yourself and sell your project to an industry that relies more on collaboration than any other art form. It is a collaborative business and the screenwriter is one of the elements that goes to make up the film, arguably the most important one. And it's very difficult being that lonely introverted writer who then has to become more extrovert and go out there and talk to these people who make decisions about money and funding to try and persuade them that the words you've written have some financial value that will help you get the film off and running. And let's not forget that films are extremely expensive to make even low budget films cost a lot of money, more than we're used to having at our disposal. So we're working in a rather irrational business where people do not know the value of the product, product until it hits the marketplace. And your job, along with your other collaborators, is to persuade people that these words you've got on your screen or your disc or whatever it is, are worth half a million euros, 1 million euros, 10 million euros, whatever the budget of the film is. And this is really hard to do. Thankfully, we have producers to help us do that, but it cannot just be left to them. And the most successful film industries are those where the screenwriter is immersed in the industry and is able to utilize those more quiet personal qualities with the external qualities of taking your project to the market. And what I would like to do is um, show you some thoughts and tips from artists from every medium, not just from the film medium, um, who have perhaps struggled with these issues and are providing us with some ideas about how we can tackle this paradox of being private and then having to be public. Well, I think one of the first bits of advice is to advise people that if you're a writer, you just have to write. We're so obsessed with, with the news at the moment and everything that's going on in a very sort of damaged world that it's very easy to lose our concentration about the creative visions that we are trying to put together. But most of the events going on we are impotent to do anything about and 
most of the time we just don't know if what we are watching on our news screens or newspapers are telling us the truth or not, or some distorted version of what is happening with some hidden political agenda. I think it's better for creative people to stand back a little bit from that and just do the work. Just sit down and write. So one of the great poets of cinema, Andrei Tarkovsky, who we associate with really pure art house cinema. I mean, he just said this very bluntly that we are in a constant struggle between art that we are trying to create and commerce where people are trying to understand what sort of money is available for the art that we are creating. So he says, cinema is an unhappy art as it depends on money. And that's blunt and true. It's just difficult. It's difficult to, to work out what your project is worth. And there are so many different ways of trying to assess the financial value of the words you put on the page. But none of them are anything close to objective. They are all guesswork based on the performance of other films in, in the past. That's how film sales agents operate. They assess your project in terms of what has happened in the past, which is a basically flawed model because it does not allow for something groundbreakingly new and original. This struggle will be with us all through our careers and we just have to deal with it. We just have to find the language to persuade people that what we're writing has value as a film that people will want to pay to go and see in whatever medium. Then let us accept that the writer has an important job to do. Um, we, we struggle with our own self-esteem in what, whether what we're doing is any good. But the bottom line is that if we can do it well, we are doing something very important that can change the world and make it a better place. So here's Albert Camus, the writer of The Plague and other prophetic novels that are very contemporary now in the zeitgeist. And he talks about chaos and says the importance of the writer is to keep civilization from destroying itself. So let's not forget that. Let's not forget that what we're doing is important, but it's hard. Um, I saw Riz Ahmed in uh, March, he won the best short film and a little extract from what he said in his acceptance speech was, in such divided times, we believe that the role of story is to remind us that there is no us and them, there's just us. So in a divided world, I think we can heed those words and realize that, that there is a value we can entertain people, of course we want to entertain people, but underlying that is a sense of trying to heal and make sense of the chaos of the world and, and bring us together. Here's something from the science fiction novelist Ursula Le Guin, who, who died a couple of years back. One of the functions of art is to give people the words to know their own experience. Storytelling is a tool for knowing who we are and what we want. And very often in my script meetings, I, I become aware that writers are writing because it's what they do, but it's also a kind of therapy. It's self-therapy to use storytelling to understand who we are and what we want. 
And I think that's, that's a great healing tool for writers who feel the need to, to tell stories. Iris Murdoch, wonderful British novelist, talking about senseless rubble. A deep motive for making art is the desire to defeat the formlessness of the world and cheer oneself up by constructing forms out of what might otherwise seem a mass of senseless rubble. Well, we don't have to look very far in the news to see the senseless rubble that's going on in the world now. And this is another way of saying that our, our stories matter and we can make sense of our lives through storytelling. Adaptations. Um, I'm sure there's one or two floating around the Nisi Roms uh, meeting rooms, very full of problems that aren't immediately apparent. Oh, that's a great book. It would make a great film. Mm, maybe, maybe not. It's not as easy as it seems to change the format from literature to cinema. And John le Carre, the great spy writer, says, in the beginning was the word. The writer lives or dies by it. To the filmmaker, in the beginning was the image. The creative battle has raged happily ever since the first movie flickered into life. So we are writing words down, but we are trying to create images. When we are reading the scripts, we are trying to see the images that you are creating on the page. There's no magic to it and it ain't easy, but that's the job that we have to do. And getting back to the way writers are, we are sensitive people. That is in the nature of the artistic genes. We are reluctant to be criticized. We want everybody to love us and quite often we want to be left alone. And Ron Neiswanner, who's um, a Hollywood screenwriter, he did Philadelphia and movies like that. A writer is someone willing to betray the people he loves in order to impress people he's never met. Now that, that's, I find that quite profound because what you're doing is you're using your own experience of the world, your family, your friends, the people you know, and constructing stories about them for an audience that you will never meet. And in a way, there is a kind of betrayal going on there. You just have to be careful that they don't recognize themselves if you're writing nasty antagonists to a close friend of you, friends of yours. But this is the only way we can use our imagination is by adapting our experiences of the world and the people we have met. Suffering for art. E.L. Doctorow, the screenwriter of Ragtime and other movies, writing is a socially acceptable form of schizophrenia. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe, maybe we get cured of our schizophrenia uh, through, through our writing and people allow us to behave in a certain way that maybe doesn't fit in with the norms of society because we are artists and we can maybe bend the rules a little bit like Vincent van Gogh as a painter and other artists who have been difficult people. Let's face it, Picasso was a difficult person and some filmmakers are difficult people, but it's what they may need to be in order to create their art and their screenplays. George Simenon, the French writer of the Maigret novels uh, on the misery of being a writer. Writing is not a profession, 
but a vocation of unhappiness. That's the deal. That's the Faustian deal we have to make in order to achieve our art. We have to suffer for our art. And if we don't, we're not going to achieve what we set out to do. We have to know that. We have to suffer for our art. The, the problem is we have to sometimes suffer in our personal lives as well to create our art. And that's down to the individual as to how they can make that balance work between life and art. Graham Greene, great British novelist, third man, etc. An unhappy childhood is a writer's gold mine. And he, he's used that in so many of his novels. And if we're just happy all the time, I guess nobody really is. You don't have the experiences that you can use in a screenplay to show that suffering that we need to see in stories. I mean, screenplays are basically about dramatic conflict. If everybody's happy, there's not really any story and nobody's gonna to want to see it. So being a lonely child, a suffering child, a renegade, difficult child is part of growing up, that gives us the tools that we can use later in life to try and find a way of expressing our art. The German writer, Thomas Mann, who did, um, most, most of his novels have been adapted into films like Death in Venice, Budenbrooks, The Magic Mountain. A writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. I keep having to read that to understand what he's saying, but I think I know what he means, that you have to dig really deep to create the good writing that we are striving for in our work, on, in our work. not just any old writing, but good writing, and that's hard. It's harder than doing a shopping list or just playing a computer game. Zadie Smith, the British novelist, resign yourself to the lifelong sadness that comes from never being satisfied. That's the artist saying that we should never be completely pleased with ourselves. We should never think that's it, it's great, it's wonderful, it's amazing, I've done it. In screenwriting perhaps more than in any other written art form because of the, the need to collaborate and the need to rewrite along the way in order that our collaborators can get a fix on what we are writing. We all know that as screenwriters, that screenwriting is basically rewriting. And if we get too pleased with ourselves, something is wrong. We have to strive constantly to do better and improve on what we've done before. Loneliness. This is Rachel Carson, who is possibly the most important nature writer the world has ever seen. The first true environmentalist who wrote the extraordinarily important book, The Silent Spring. She was the first person to acknowledge that man was messing up nature with all its disgusting chemicals. And she wrote, writing is a lonely occupation at best. 
During the actual work of creation, the writer cuts himself off from all others and confronts his subject alone. He or she moves into a realm where he or she has never been before, perhaps where no one else has ever been. It is a lonely place, even a little frightening. By the way, I really think someone needs to make a film about Rachel Carson. She was an extraordinary person. She suffered a terrible illness and, and died early. She was gay in a time when she wasn't allowed to be gay. She led an extraordinary life. So if somebody's looking for a biopic subject, I would urge you to check out the life of Rachel Carson because I I looked it up and it doesn't seem to me that anyone anyone has done that before one of the most important figures of the 20th century writing and let's go back a bit it's not just a contemporary malaise this is Juvenal the Roman poet who lived from AD 60 to AD 120, many suffer from the incurable disease of writing and it becomes chronic in their sick minds. Well, that's telling it like it is. Uh, so it, it ain't nothing new. If we're writing, we've just got to deal with it, whatever madness or craziness comes our way while we're trying to do it. And so that's a couple of thousand years ago and it's exactly the same with screenwriting. We go a little bit crazy trying to get it done. It's part of the journey. We have to go there. We have to do that. All right, I'll, um, I'll read this out because it's a bit longer. Uh, I found this in um, a book of short stories by the, the great Spanish writer Cervantes. They were called exemplary stories. He wrote them in 1613, and it's from a story called The Dog's Colloquy, in which two dogs called Scipio and Berganza are talking to each other. And it's about pitching, pitching at the beginning of the 17th century. Dogs. Right, I'm afraid that at the speed you're going, you won't get halfway through your story. And I want to point out to you something. And that is that some stories contain their appeal in themselves, others in the way they are told. In other words, there are some which, even without preambles and elegant language, give pleasure. And there are others which need to be decked out with words and with gestures of the face and hands and changes in the tone of voice something comes out of nothing and instead of being weak and feeble they become witty and pleasing that's what we're trying to do with pitching it's for screenwriters of course it's like going to the dentist it's a necessary evil that we don't really enjoy well we don't seem to enjoy it in Europe they seem to enjoy it rather more in America but that's a different culture where screenwriters have always been more closely involved in the way the industry promotes itself and gets its scripts sold but I'm getting back to to this paradox of of being the introverted writer and then having to stand up in front of a bunch of people as I, I think most of you did this weekend and tell people what your story is. It's really hard to do um, and the hardest thing about pitching is that because we're the creators of the project we can't see the wood for the trees. It's very hard to stand back from this hundred pages with all these different ideas floating around and to summarize it. It's often better to get somebody you trust or a producer, if you're lucky enough to have a good creative producer to 
work with you on the pitching and finding those words and compact sentences that convey the essence of what it is that you want to convey in your film. Now, my background was as a film buyer and I wasn't very good at it, but when I started, I was sent to these film markets and festivals and told to go and buy some scripts that were going to be made into films or recommend them for purchase by the British company I was with. And I didn't know how to do that. So what I would do is I would go to the databases or the programs, because this was pre-internet age, and I would just look at the title, look at the people who were writing it, and read the logline. Read two or three lines about what the project was about. And if it looked interesting, I'd read the short synopsis that was with it. And if I thought, hmm, that sounds like the sort of thing I'm supposed to be looking for. And then I might investigate further and take the meeting with somebody who was trying to set up the film. And that still basically carries on today that people interested in your project don't want to just read the script straight away. They want to, firstly, they want to know you because the industry <clears throat> is very much a people industry and people only work with you because they like you and because they will have to spend some time with you. So again, you have to address the social graces of making somebody like you at a film market, at a festival, at a workshop, so that they're going to have that conversation. So what is it you're working on at the moment? And you just need a very concise reply to that because they don't want you to really go into the story and say, well, then this happens, but I'm not quite sure if that happens or this happens. I'm still thinking about it. Oh yeah, and I didn't tell you about the girl and the murderer. And after 10 seconds, you will get a thousand mile stare from that person who is immediately looking to escape because they don't want to get bogged down in the intricacies of your story. They want a succinct, log line, they want a few sentences, they want to know the genre. And if you're able to do it, the other thing that they want is a tagline. And the tagline is different to the log line. The log line is just basically the story of what happens in the film in a succinct couple of sentences. The tagline is what goes on the poster. And this is one that I'm particularly fond of, an old, very cheesy Marilyn Monroe vehicle called Niagara, with on the poster, a raging torrent of emotion that even nature can't control, Niagara. I mean, it's bullshit, of course, but that's, that's what you get on the posters. In space, no one can hear you scream. That's the alien tagline that many people quote as, as the most well-known one. It doesn't actually make any sense. It doesn't even relate particularly to what's happening. But somehow, in space, no one can hear you scream is a tagline that works perfectly for that particular film. And if you can find some kind of tagline, which is usually more identified with the theme of what your screenplay is about. And you can give them a couple of sentences of a logline and you can give them an idea about the theme in a sort of tagline form, you'll grab their attention. That's, that's what will work. Have we still got the group? My picture's gone of um, the room. Can, can, can they still hear us? 
I can hear you perfectly. Give me a moment just to check. Uh, yes, we can. If I think everything is okay, but let yeah, me we see. can we can hear and and see as well. Perfect. Okay, I just got it. Just went black the screen, but that's fine. As long as they they can hear me, that's all mm -hmm. right. So. Um, yeah, you want to write the script. You don't want, like, like, like Picasso and Matisse, you don't want to explain to people what your picture is about. It just is supposed to present all its elements in itself. As screenwriters, we feel the same about our screenplays. We want people to read it. They, you, they don't want you to have to pitch it and tell it, but it's the only way you can get the meetings to lead to the money being granted by the guys in suits and the people with the money to make the film a reality. Because the, the dirty secret about people who invest in films is they hate reading scripts. And they've usually got so many of them on their desk. And I was that person. And it, it's so depressing when people come give you more and more scripts. Just have a quick look at this. Just have a quick look at this. Of course, eventually they, they will read the script if they think it's interesting. But you have to find a way to catch their attention before they read the script and make yourself and make the project interesting for them. And that's being nice, being a little bit extrovert, being interesting, being succinct, perhaps that's the most important element of all, being succinct in, a, able, in being able to convey the essence of what your story is about. But sometimes it's very hard when you're meeting the big boss, the big cheese of companies, and you're really excited because they've had the script for a while and you're so eager to talk about the script. And here's a comment from Mark Twain on a bad review of one of it on it without having read it. And you're very lucky if the decision maker you are speaking to has actually read the script properly because most of them are relying on readers and assistants to tell them what the script is like before they'll take the meeting with you to decide whether they want to become involved in the development, in the production uh, of the project. In smaller industries, that's less true because the most independent film companies are, are just a few core people. And I think the situation is much better now than it was when I entered the industry in, in the 80s where the bosses never, ever read the scripts. They didn't know how to read them. But I think the industry has evolved where the big decision makers now have understood the need for not only their marketing distribution accounting skills but also their creative skills in fact i would say it is the the biggest single change i have seen in the industry in the decades i've been working here is the rise of creative producers who are not just good at raising the money but they're good at collaborating with you, the screenwriters, on how to take the project in the right direction to get it made and to get it successful. And that, that's a wonderful um, evolution that really it's the independent film sector in Europe has been responsible for, and especially the support of um, institutions like Creative Europe's media program, which has been amazing in terms of helping to train producers to understand the need to be creative producers with schemes like ARV and ACE. 
etc and a bunch of other ones as well as the screenwriting workshops which um, have trouble getting the money but here we are at the MFI and it's it's working so I'm delighted that that's happening because it's necessary it's also necessary of course for screenwriters to get together sometimes and network because it's a lonely business so uh, this is another element of what we we need to do because if you're a screenwriter you don't necessarily meet other write writers unless you get out there and turn off your introvert button and put the extrovert button on Samuel Beckett in a 1983 play, Westward Ho. This is a well-known um, marketing hook now that business people use. It's, I'm sure many of you know it, but I love it. Ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Fail better is the key to rewriting and it is a really important one to remember because we all know as screenwriters that we are going to confront rejection a lot of the time that's the business that we just have to go on knocking on the doors until the right one is there that will take us to the next stage we want to get to Even the worst filmmaker in the world realized that rewriting was necessary. As an American screenwriter, I've had the pleasure of knowing called Scott Alexander, who wrote the screenplay for Ed Wood, the film about the man who was considered the worst filmmaker in the world with films like Plan 9 from Outer Space although that is now um, an ongoing debate about who's made the first, the worst film in the world. Um, and in the film, there's this line that made me chuckle when Ed, Ed Wood is talking to his girlfriend. You know, honey, when you rewrite a script, it just gets better and better. So everybody knows it, even the worst filmmakers in the world. James Baldwin reminding us that it's not enough just to be brilliant. We have to stick to the task. Inspiration and perspiration, I call this. Talent is insignificant. I know a lot of talented ruins. Beyond talent lie all the usual words, discipline, love, luck, but most of all, endurance. Back in the, the 90s, I um, worked at a media funded institution called the European Script Fund, which dealt with um, the development of European projects before they went back to Brussels in the in this century. And our chairman was was uh, Sir Richard Attenborough, the director of Gandhi, etc. And um, I remember he was talking about this and he was, he said, um, well, they say, they say it's that getting a film made is 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration, but they're wrong. They're wrong. It's at least 95% perspiration and just 5% inspiration. Endurance. You just got to stick with it. I, I've been so impressed by some screenwriters I've seen who really couldn't crack the project, but they just stuck with it and they stuck with it until they got it. And it does require enormous discipline and self-belief to keep on going in a world where rejection is the easiest thing to do and acceptance is the most difficult. Eugene Delacroix, the 18th century French romantic painter, 
First, learn to be a craftsman. It won't keep you from being a genius. It's the same thing. It's like you have to learn the tools. You can't, if everybody tells you you're brilliant, be very careful. It's okay if your mum says that. But if people say, wow, you're, you're a genius, it's not enough. It's not enough to be an effective screenwriter. You have to have that ability to learn the craft. Actually, there's signs of that in, maybe it's a little unfair to say this, but I'll share it with you anyway. In, in Britain, um, there's quite a lot of, let's say, genius novelists, people who are adored in the literary world, who were hired to adapt their own novels for the screenplay, and they were crap. They were rubbish at adapting their own novels. There's one or two exceptions, but, but mostly there, there are many of the best known novelists who just couldn't be bothered to learn the tools of screenwriting because everybody told them how brilliant they were and it would be easy. And the other element of that is that they were, they couldn't kill their own babies, if you know what I mean. They couldn't release some of the things in the novels that didn't adapt well to the cinema screen. So this, this is a craft and there are tools that we can pick up to help us make the scripts better. Fear, yeah, we have to, to deal with this. So I'm sure many of you have either read the novel or seen the HBO series of A Handmaid's Tale in which our heroine finds this little Latin quote scrawled on the bottom of the cupboard in her very bare room. I don't know if I can say that, but I'll try. Nolite de bastardas caba rondorum. Forgive my Latin. I'm told that it means don't let the bastards wear you down. And that's, that worked for this wonderful character in The Handmaid's Tale. And it should work for us as well, because everybody hates getting rejected, but we will be rejected. Even Martin Scorsese gets rejected, because they don't under... I saw, when I was a buyer, I saw him pitching The Last Temptation of Christ, and I just wanted to crawl under my chair because he was talking to a cynical bunch of distributors who didn't understand what he was trying to explain to them and all they cared about was whether Mary Magdalene was going to be seen in the nude or not and I just I just couldn't bear the treatment of of a great filmmaker like that by people who didn't have a creative gene amongst them but this is the, the struggle that we have in art versus commerce. The people responsible for the commerce are not necessarily creatively in tune with our work and we have to find the language to persuade them that something is good. A lesson I learned as a film buyer, but it took me a long time to learn how to do that. Ernest Hemingway, again, it's, it's similar to the James Baldwin quote. There is nothing to writing. All you do is sit down as a typewriter and bleed. You just got to stick with it. I guess we don't bleed so much on our computers. A little bit. We certainly get arthritis eventually. So stick with it. Don't give up. I'm sure some of you are Nick Cave fans. Um, he has this wonderful free newsletter called um, The Red Hand Files. Maybe some of you know it, where people can ask him any questions in the world about anything. And he gives wonderfully wise answers. I mean, he's had such a tragic time of it. 
poor Nick Cave, having lost two sons in the last few years. Um, but it's, it's led him to this wisdom and understanding about the world that I think is very useful for creative people. And he's writing here about writer's block. I mean, he's a lyricist, so he's talking about writing words, but it applies just the same to what we're doing as screenwriters. In my experience, lyrics are almost always seemingly just not coming. This is the tearful ground zero of songwriting, at least for some of us. This lack of motion, this sense of suspended powerlessness can feel extraordinarily desperate for a songwriter. But the thing you must hold on to through these difficult periods, as hard as it may be, is this. When something's not coming, it's coming. It took me many years to learn this, and to this day, I have trouble remembering it. And funnily enough, I, I, um, a friend got in touch with me yesterday to say that our mutual friend, who is um, a Ukrainian screenwriter and director, a woman who is in Sarajevo at the moment, to get away from all the crap going on in her country. And I got in touch with her and she's suffering terrible writer's block because of the state of the world and because she doesn't know what's happening to her family. Back up. And I sent her this quote and um, she wrote back this morning to say how happy it had made her, how it had unlocked something for her and um, I think we all have to remember when we are blocked, uh, we just have to keep going. Frédéric Chopin, the Polish composer, simplicity is the final achievement. After one has played a vast quantity of notes, and more notes, it is the simplicity that emerges as the crowning moment of art. Now this in a way is, is another paradox for screenwriters to struggle with because we want our, screen, our screenplays to be complex and have lots of stuff going on and more so now than ever because the audience has evolved as tastes have evolved. If, if you look at uh, television drama from the 1980s now, it's basically unwatchable. It is so slow and ponderous and simplistic and silly that it's just boring. And now for reasons that we all know about with the high-end TV dramas raising the bar on screenwriting. Audiences demand complexity with five or six or seven different storylines going on all at once in each episode. Look at um, what, what's the stuff on our Stranger Things. It, it, it's incredibly complex the Game of Thrones. I mean, it's got so many things going on at once, but we can absorb it because we want that complexity. But at the same time, we're searching for simplicity in how those stories are put together. It's a kind of paradox, but I think, I think you know what I mean. The problem I see in so many scripts is that something is not quite working and producers, advisors, script editors, friends say, no, you need to add another character, you need to put more in. And they just throw lots more stuff at it in the hope that it will get better. And it very rarely happens. It's actually about finding the essence of what the story was about, the, the, the vision and the theme 
of what it was and finding that simplicity in the story is the key to making it work. And there's a lot of great artists who have told us this. Here's a pretty important guy, Leonardo da Vinci. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Well, I think he's a pretty complex guy, but yeah. If you, if you go to the essence of his works, there is a, a beautiful simplicity and beauty in them. And this is, this is a cliche, there's even screenplay workshops called Less is More. Um, it, the fact that it's a cliche doesn't mean it's wrong. It's, it's still useful to remember. And um, people told me it was, it was from the minimalist architect Mies van der Rohe, to whom it was commonly attributed, and Buckminster Fuller with his domes. But actually, uh, the origin of this tiny little important phrase is from a poem, a poem by Robert Browning in 1855 called Andrea del Sarto. Yet do much less, so much less. Well, less is more, Lucretia, I am judged. So there you go. There's a little um, pub quiz question that you can use. Um, my, um, my daughter-in-law is quite a successful Irish novelist. And she was telling me about the simpli simplicity of storytelling because she writes novels and short stories and then she told me about this six word story maybe some of you know it I was amazed she said that's the shortest story ever written attributed to Ernest Hemingway and I said you're kidding me you can't tell a story in six words for sale baby shoes never worn that's a story it makes our mind buzz with what that means about a child who maybe died or disappeared or whatever. So that's taking simplicity to the nth degree. And I'm not saying you should do that with screenplays, but if something is getting messy and confusing and over complex, strip it down. Try, try and remember what it was you were trying to say originally. Yeah, here's George Frederick Hegel, about whom I don't understand a single word. Uh, but I have smarter friends who try and tell me that he's actually important. And even he acknowledged this problem. It is easier to be sublimely unintelligible than to be comprehensible in a simple way which he apparently said after delivering his 600 page theory of philosophy that his friends could not understand. So I guess he had to go back to the drawing board and write a few log lines and tag lines to help people get to grips with it. If you are a screenwriter who's demands to be complex and visionary. Visionary is a dangerous word. I uh, read an interview with Stephen Frears, the brilliant British director of so many amazing films, My Beautiful Laundrette, Dangerous Liaisons, etc., who, who thinks that the whole Ortier th theory is complete bunkum. He says it's ridiculous, this idea of the director as God, that they have some vision about the film. He says, I'm 80 and I've never had a vision in my life. I just know how to direct films. So be careful if you're telling people about your vision and demanding to be recognized as a poet, because if people don't understand what it is you're trying to convey, it ain't gonna get made. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with The Writer's Journey, which is one of the best books on screenwriting that, that I know. It's one of the few that I can understand clearly. Um, obviously, I, I don't have time 
in this talk to get into the uh, details of that, uh, but um, I'm fortunate enough to know Chris Vogler, who, who wrote this guide for screenwriting um, based on the work of Joseph Campbell, the folklorist and his view of how all the mythologies of the world share common characteristics that are quite useful uh, for screenwriters to take. You, you can take it or leave it. Um, sometimes I find it useful to adapt some of the elements of the hero's journey when screenplays are stuck. For me, they're not useful before you write, they're only useful after you've written to see if there's some way that you can find a shortcut or an easier, simple solution to, to take the story forward. But even Chris, um, in his talks, might go into considerable detail about the mythical elements required for the interior and exterior journey of your protagonists. I'm already getting a bit too philosophical and pretentious there. But he also says, don't forget Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. So that's one of the great screenplay theorists is saying, don't, don't get too complex because we won't understand it. Back to James Baldwin. The hardest thing in the world is simplicity and the most fearful thing too. It's hard, it's hard to get that simplicity, but if you can do it, you will succeed if you get your ideas clearly coming through in the screenplay. And here's Charlie Mingus, the great jazz musician. When he's talking about jazz, it applies just the same to screenplay writing. Making the simple complicated is commonplace. Making the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. That's what we need to try and do. Marcel Proust, the author of The Endless Remembrance of Things Past, one of the longest books in the world that takes hundreds of pages to describe making a cup of tea, that I remember from my university days. But even he, who goes into amazing detail about 19th century life, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So what he's talking about is seeing the world that we are familiar with, but looking at it with new eyes, as great photographers can do, as great artists can do, and as great screenplay writers can do by taking the normal world and looking at it in a particular way. And if I think about the great social realist filmmakers like the Darden brothers and Ken Loach, they, they take the banal normality of people on the margins of society and look at them with new eyes and create great cinema and draw our attention to them in a way that we haven't seen before and help us to understand the world better. So that's something that we can strive for. Samuel Johnson, the English writer of the first English dictionary, the two most engaging powers of an author are to make new things familiar and familiar things new. He's saying just, just the same thing, to make familiar things new, have a new angle on them, have a new take on them. And then we go and see the film and we think, yeah, that's true, I never, I never looked at it that way. That's what we're, we're looking for in our work. 
Stanley Kubrick. Just this is um, to make us feel better, really. If it can be written or thought, it can be filmed. And he managed that in an amazing way. That's kind of, I'm giving you so much bad news, this is good news. If it can be written down and you've got geniuses like Stanley Kubrick around, it can be filmed somehow if you can find the right way of expressing it in your words. Leo Tolstoy. The best stories don't come from good versus bad, but from good versus good. I, I love that. Um, I, I read War and Peace back in my student days. I thought it was the greatest novel ever written. And it's full of that. It's full of good versus good, which is much more interesting than good versus bad, which is just so obvious and white hats and black hats. It's that time has gone. We, we need to understand that in our stories, in our characterizations, everything is gray, nothing is black and white anymore because that's how the world is. And we have to reflect that in our stories. Anton Chekhov, the, the great playwright, who um, I think he would have been a, an amazing screenwriter if only he'd lived during the 20th century, but he didn't. Um, but he seemed to understand what was required for screenwriting, even though the medium didn't exist. So he says, don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. That's cinema, that's what we're striving for, trying to find a new way of looking at familiar things and finding the poetic, lyrical way to present a script that is visually going to be exciting and intriguing for us to look at. David Mamet, who's a difficult bastard, but um, he's written some good scripts. The biggest crime is telling the audience what they already know. Um, that's something I see quite a lot. And you, you can see audiences shuffle in their seats if that happens on screen, because a character is explaining what we've just seen five minutes before. We don't want that kind of repetition. We want the shorthand. Cinema audiences, streaming audiences, mobile phone audiences are very sophisticated in understanding the way stories evolve and develop. And it's, it's quite a good exercise to go through your screenplay and just check, have I said anything here that they already know about and I'm saying it again? If they have, cut it out. Every, everybody probably knows this. Um, it's another one of the cliches. It's from one of the best books about the industry I've ever read, Adventures in the Screen Trade by William Goldman, the amazing Hollywood screenwriter of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and so many other uh, great movies. The whole book is about the stupidity of the decision makers in Hollywood. And he says it again and again and again, nobody knows anything. And it's kind of reassuring uh, for us that some people know something, I guess. And to get back to what I was saying in the start, we are working in an irrational industry where there are no objective decisions about the qu quality or financial value of your script. There are only hopefully some professionally informed opinions about it. I think the Hollywood studios are probably the biggest villains in terms of nobody knows anything in the way they have. They continue to churn out bland formulaic 
stuff as well as the more powerful intriguing stuff that's more, that has come more from the independent industry than from the studios uh, themselves that's another debate but um we can reassure ourselves a little bit that there is there is no absolute opinion about scripts there's only subjective views and that's why we have to keep knocking on the different doors until we find the door that opens and says yes i love this here's the money go and make the movie another well-known cliche thing from an old studio boss back in the 30s apparently he was impossible to deal with irving thalberg the writer is the most important person in hollywood but we must never tell the sons of bitches that's changed um, to an extent now. Uh, back in the day, um, I, I met one of those writers, um, Julius Epstein, who was one of the writers on Casablanca, who was telling me about how in, back in that studio system that Thalberg and his fellow dictators ran, um, you had the electricians shared, you had the artists shared, and you had the writers shared on the lot. And they were just paid the same as the electricians and the riggers and everybody else. And his story was that Thor Thorberg um, burst into the room and said, why aren't you typing? I'm paying you to type. And Julius Epstein said, we're thinking. And Thorberg said, I ain't paying you to think, I'm paying you to write. That's how writers were treated back in the day. It's taken a long time for screenwriters to be acknowledged now, but it's where TV has played a massively important role in raising the profile of the screenwriters where they're actually acknowledged for the importance that they do carry. Um, in the business and with showrunners and streaming platforms, the writer is the big boss now. And that, that's a wonderful evolution. So his view is out of date now. I'll just finish by giving you very quickly, I'll run through these points from the British novelist, Janet Winterson, who wrote Oranges of the Only Fruit and some other great novels. Uh, turn up for work, discipline allows creative freedom, no discipline equals no freedom. Never stop when you are stuck, you may not be able to solve the problem, but turn it aside and write something else, do not stop altogether. Love what you do, be honest with yourself, if you're no good, accept it. If the work you're doing is no good, accept it. If it's good, accept it. Don't hold on to poor work. If it was bad when it went in the drawer, it will be just as bad when it comes out. Take no notice of anyone you don't respect. Take no notice of anyone with a gender agenda. A lot of men still think that women have an imagination of the fiery kind. Be ambitious for the work and not for the reward. Trust your creativity, enjoy the work. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you've at least enjoyed seeing pictures of these great people. I kind of like seeing what they look like and hope I've been able to give a few tips that might be useful for you over the coming days. I've just been giving you ideas from other people and trying to put them in the context of, of what we are doing as screenwriters and trying to push a few buttons of inspiration. Um, if, if you want to talk to me privately at some point, I'd be happy to receive some, some questions online. Thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful time in Nisiros. Enjoy the ice cream, which is very special there. And I hope to, well, I'll be seeing a few of you online over the coming days and I hope I'll meet more of you next year or somewhere else in this crazy industry that we work in. So thank, thank you for your attention and bye for now.